All right, good morning. Welcome to Breakfast with the Bible. So today we're beginning Psalm 56, uh, 13 verses, not really that complicated. Uh, we'll do the whole thing right now. Starting with the superscription to the chief musician upon Genethelem Rechakim. Uh, Miktam of David when the Philistines took him in Gath. So I'm, I probably butchered those words, but that's okay. Be merciful unto me, O God, for man would swallow me up. He, fighting daily, oppresses me. Mine enemies would daily swallow me up, for they may, for they be many that fight against me, O thou most high. What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. In God, I will praise his word. In God, I have put my trust. I will not fear what flesh can do unto me. Every day they rest my words. All their thoughts are against me for evil. They gather themselves together. They hide themselves. They mark my steps when they wait for my soul. Shall they escape by iniquity? In thine anger, cast down the people, O God. Thou tellest my wanderings. Put thou my tears into thy bottle. Are they not in thy book? When I cry unto thee, unto thee, then shall mine enemies turn back. This I know, for God is for me. In God will I praise his word. In the Lord will I praise his word. In God have I put my trust. I will not be afraid what man can do unto me. Thy vows are upon me, O God. I will render praises unto thee, for thou hast delivered my soul from death. Wilt not thou deliver my feet from falling, that I may walk before thee? God in the light of the living. All right, so this is a psalm of David sung to the tune. So this this word, uh, Jonathalem Rekakim, if that's how you pronounce it, this is uh, a, a tune that's called the silent dove in distant lands. So the psalm was written sometime between David's visit to the tabernacle at Nob and his arrival in Adalam. So we don't know, obviously we don't know the tune, what it sounds like, but it sounds to me that this, uh, a dove in, in a silent dove in distant lands, sounds like a helpless creature in a place where he's unfamiliar, a place where maybe he's not safe, could be um, really kind of maybe they used that tune because of you know David felt like a helpless creature in, in an unsafe place um, so it's all really speculation because we don't have enough information on that but it's interesting to think about so in verse 1 be merciful unto me O God for man would swallow me up he fighting daily oppresses me David cries unto God for mercy and the mercy being not receiving what you may deserve. Now, David isn't necessarily suggesting he feels he is to blame for his enemy's hatred toward him, but I believe he understands that any breath he's allowed to take at any time is because of, of the Lord's mercy. So he's really kind of asking God to do to, to be merciful because that's that's God's character. That's the way. David is used to God behaving, God performing. Be merciful unto me, O God. And then he says, why? He says, for man will swallow me up. He's, he's, daily he's fighting against me. Daily he's oppressing me. David never seems to be lacking enemies from one place or another. He's, he always seems to have somebody who's opposed to him. And if you're going to be a follower of Christ, you're going to have people who are opposed to you. It, it, when you stand up for truth, when you stand up for God's word, for God's way, you will have people who will come out of the woodwork just to tell you how they feel, just to tell you how much they disagree with you, just to, to it, it incites so much hatred from people who don't agree that just, even if you were just to stand up in a public setting, and just say it, you will get people who will just 
give you all the reasons why they don't believe you or they disagree. And I think that's that's really what we sign up for. That's that's part of being a believer is knowing that you're going to have people who will oppose you some more than others. So from Philistines to Saul to the Ziphites and even his own family, David is familiar with this the sense of having people against him. But David experiences in, in that is something we should be prepared for. Again, there's always going to be people who are opposed. There's always going to be people who disagree and almost, you know, irately will disagree. You know, something that we should just be aware of that's going to happen and, and really be prepared for it. You know, in, in particular, uh, not necessarily the circumstances, but the fact that people will oppose. If you desire to be a man or a woman of God, you will have enemies. You may even gain some when you decide to change and to repent and to follow Christ. You'll, you'll gain enemies that you didn't have before, some who would have used to have been your friends or even family. Many, for, for no apparent reason, and you will be hated. God says, Christ says himself, you will be hated for my sake. You will be hated for being a follower of me. It's, it's, it's the way it's going to go. In, in this psalm, David expresses in verse 1, he feels oppressed every day. This is constant. David probably isn't sleeping well. David is waking up and he's constantly looking at this opposition that he's always got against him. Verses 3 and 4 um, and, and really, verse 2 kind of highlights that again. He says, my enemies would daily swallow me up for they be many that fight against me. David is just really telling God, this: there are so many people against me. Everywhere I go, every time I escape somebody, there's somebody new who's opposing me. Somebody new who's, who's really opposing God. And he's, David really just wants a break. He says, be merciful unto me. Give me... Give me some rest. Give me a moment where this isn't happening. So verses 3 and 4, what time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. Verse 3 is, is a relatively familiar verse. I think it's quoted quite often when, when somebody's afraid. They will, they will, when you have a child who's afraid, when you have somebody you know who's, who's in fear, people will often kind of prescribe this verse. What time I am afraid... I will trust in thee. Remember, when you're afraid, trust in God. This is what this verse is saying. In God, I will praise his word. In God, I have put my trust. I will not fear what flesh can do unto me. Re regarding these, these verses, Spurgeon suggested, it is possible for the fear and faith to occupy the mind at the same moment. This isn't, this isn't the debilitating fear necessarily. This is a this is a fear that you're aware of, and you can still kind of recognize your trust in God at the same time. Now, what I see in verses 3 and 4 is a progression. Now, look close. Verse 3 says, what time I am afraid, or when I am afraid, I will trust in thee. Thinking, you know, you could even apply that to right now if you're not afraid, but you're, you're looking ahead. When I'm going to be afraid, when I'm afraid... It's not happening at the moment, but when it does, I will trust in thee. This is a planning ahead for it. But then verse 4, you know, this is this is a sequence. Verse 4 says, you know, that I have put my trust in thee. So in verse 3, he will, he's going to, I will trust in thee. It's reminding himself. Not that, that he had stopped trusting, but... You know, I think it's possible to, to forget that trust to a little bit. You know, you you kind of forget the trust you do have in God. So it kind of just passes. You, you become afraid. You doubt. You, you have these moments in, in your mind and your emotions and, and that kind of contradict the trust that you have. But it's only because you've kind of forgotten. You've taken your eyes off. doesn't mean you stop trusting. It just means you've, you've kind of let the... the the knowledge of that kind of slip away for a moment. 
And again, verse 4 says, I have put my trust in thee, which explains now the next part. I will not fear what people may do unto me. I don't, I don't have to be afraid what flesh can do unto me because I put my trust in God. When I'm afraid, I will trust in God. In him will I praise his word. And I have put my trust. This is after you remember. When I'm afraid, I will trust in thee. Now, I have trusted. Now you're there. You're in the moment where you're, you recognize and remember. I, I have trusted in God. So what am I afraid of? I will not fear what anybody can do unto me. Doesn't There is nobody on this planet that can... in contrast, harm you more than God can save you. Now, think of it think of it as a balance, okay? There's harm and there's there's the, the safety in God. The safety in God doesn't change. Physical harm, that's that's you know dropping a bucket. No big deal. In comparison to what God can do. See, you are safe in God, even if you're physically in harm's way. Because well, I'm going to go on a, a little rabbit trail here for a moment. But we have tendency to think that God fits into our definitions of the words we use to describe him. For instance, mercy. Our English version, or even the Greek or the Hebrew version of the word mercy, will never accurately describe the actual mercy that God has. What does that mean? That means that God can show mercy in a way that doesn't make sense to us. It means that when we describe love, we describe it in, in a box that we've created for that term. God's love is so much bigger than our definition for it, which is why people get mad when you say, you know, well, you know, why would a loving God do that? Well, because you're, you're keeping that definition into a box that you can comprehend. You can't fully comprehend the love of God or the mercy of God or even the wrath of God. It's impossible because we can't, we can't create words for, you know, for a, 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 an accurate definition of who God is. So we have to work with what we have. So, when you're in harm's way, physically speaking, and you're a believer, you're still safe. It means your safety in God goes beyond the physical realm, goes beyond your life. It goes, you know, if, if I end up being murdered or, or put to death for my faith, all you've done is destroyed the body. And momentarily at that, because Scripture says that we will get a new one. So what you've really done is 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 nothing. So why would David here say, "I will not fear what flesh can do unto me"? Because because your flesh is really only a momentary instance in time. God God goes on forever. Our life, our spirit goes on forever if you are a follower of Christ. So David is saying it doesn't matter what flesh can do unto me. It doesn't matter what people can do, what, what my oppressors can do, whether it's Saul or, or my son or the Philistines or Goliath or a bear. It doesn't matter because I put my trust in God and God is bigger than all of those things, excuse me, all of those things put together. So David is saying, you know, I was, I was afraid because I, I was overwhelmed. There was people all around opposing me. 
But then I remembered my trust in God. And I said, you know what? It doesn't matter. I, I, I remember the trust that I had in God. Now I say I've trusted in God. I put my trust in God. So I don't have to be afraid of these things. I could say, sure, I'm not really going to enjoy being oppressed by these enemies from various sides. But I don't have to be afraid to the point of wondering what's going to happen if they do end up taking my life. I'm not afraid for that. So we have to remember that the trust we put in God is our security. Doesn't, doesn't mean you're not going to face harm and trouble right now. That's a promise. God, God already said you would. But it's to know that I'm still safe. I'm still safe in his hands. Think of the word, think of healing. People pray all the time for so-and-so to get healed. But, and I'm going to use a believer as an example here. So you're praying for your relative or your friend or whatever who's a believer to be, to be healed. And God doesn't do it. And this person passes away. Guess what? That person is still healed. That person has been delivered and they're in a better situation than you are. They're in better, you're, you could be at the top of your game. You could be as healthy as a horse and they have now passed on to a better scenario. They're in better shape than you'll ever be this side of glory. So what's there really to be afraid of? I don't know. That was my rabbit trail. Verse five, every day they rest my words. So they, they twist my words, they... They put words in my mouth. They say things I didn't say, and they, they just kind of mess it all up. All their thoughts are against me for evil. So they take everything I do, everything I say, and they turn it, and they twist it, and they make it mean something it doesn't mean. Being afraid is a real thing. Sometimes we let our guard down. We forget the moment we that we had trust in God. These kinds of things that people that, that twist your words and they, they put things against you and they it seems like everybody's there everybody's and they and people are believing it people are saying oh that's you know I can't believe that that's horrible I mean that person would do that or say that and and we get we get afraid of, of how we're gonna have to face it how we're gonna deal with it but David here is is saying these people come against me with their words, with their thoughts, and with their, their plans and their agendas. I don't have to be afraid of that. David's enemies, they took his words and they twisted it. So David is put in a place of helplessness because they are so against him, there's, there's really nothing he could even say. They would take even the most innocent set of words that he could come up with and they would find a way to manipulate it and make it sound like something against David. Verse six, they gather themselves together. They hide themselves. They mark my steps when they wait for my soul. They're planning. They're, they're coming together. They're, they're, they're setting these plans up. You know, it sounds a lot like society today. They're kind of working in the, behind the, the curtain, you know, like the Wizard of Oz kind of thing. They're kind of manipulating the scenarios and changing things around and making it look like something's relatively innocent but they're taking our words and they're twisting it. They're taking God's word and they're twisting it and they're moving it and saying things that it doesn't say. They're using verses that aren't applicable to certain situations. They're, they're making excuses for why it's wrong. They're saying, well, if God is love, then I should be able to love however I see fit. They're, they're, they're taking the innocency of God's word, the very, the very core of our beliefs, the very core of, of the power of God in our lives. And they're turning it around. They're making us an enemy. They're making us, you know, the, the, the topic of discussion, the topic of complaint, the topic of, of just, I mean, it, it's really, the, 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 it's, it's always been a spiritual battle. It's always been you know, good and evil. It's not right wing, left wing, one race, another race. And for the record, as long as you keep talking about race and 
color and you know those kinds of things there will always be division get away from that conversation don't don't stop talking about you know well because of this particular ethnicity then i can determine that this there's a pre-described kind of thing that's going it doesn't have to be that way every time you talk about it every time you bring it up you're you're promoting the division that's happening so when i forgot where i was going but yeah i lost it i'm 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 thinking of it's it's just the enemies are are trying to manipulate God's word and what we know to be true and turning it into a lie. Good becoming evil and evil becoming good. It's everywhere we look. So they're they're constantly watching him, hoping to see him fail, looking for any reason or opportunity to to take him down. And this is what our enemies will do. They will they will watch us, looking for chances to catch us failing or, or make us look bad. They'll they'll say, "Well, your God isn't isn't any better than than this guy's God or or whatever," because you still mess up. Well, that's your problem right there. You've put faith in man instead of faith in God. But that's a whole other topic. Verse seven: They shall es- shall they escape by iniquity? In thine anger, cast down thy people, O God. Is it is it right for the wicked to triumph? Are they going to escape? Are they going to get away with it? David asks God to cast them down. Come, come down now and take take care of it. Are they are going to, are they going to get rid of get away with this forever? David wants to see God administer justice, and for the sake of it at the moment, God want, David wants to see it happen now. David wants relief. David is so overwhelmed by his enemies; he wants God to do something now, and it's. It, it, it's what Dave, David is desperate for. And verse 8. Thou tellest my wanderings, put thou my tears into thy bottle, are they not in thy book? Now I think this is a verse we sometimes read and miss. Now we quote it a lot to give comfort. You know, God, God collects all your tears. He counts your tears and he keeps them in his bottle so he can, you know, he pays attention to them. He, you know, and, and this is probably a figurative kind of image. You know, God takes your tears figuratively and puts them in a bottle. And it's really just the truth that God pays attention to our pain and suffering. God, if God's able to put all of my tears in a bottle, then that means he pays attention to every single one of them means he knows each one he knows why each one fell he knows the cause for each one and he makes note of that he pays attention to it david closes this portion of this psalm this way to to substantiate his request in 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 verse one be merciful i i know you see my suffering you you collect my tears you pay attention to every cry that i have I know you take notice. This is just one more example of David's confidence and boldness when he comes to God in prayer. Be merciful unto me, God, because I know. I know you pay attention to my need. I know you pay attention to my tears. They're in a bottle. They're in your book. You know. And David comes to God in boldness saying, this is why I'm here. Because I am oppressed. I am overwhelmed. I cry. I can't sleep. And I know you notice. In verse 9, when I cry unto thee, then shall my enemies turn back. This I know, for God is for me. This is, this is referring back to David's confidence. And it's, it's reverberated in this verse. When I cry, then shall my enemies turn back. I, when I call on God, God is going to do something because God is for me. I for I know for for God is for me when I cry when I need you when I'm in trouble when I'm alone God you will be there for me this is David's trust this is David's confidence because I know that you were for me we should be this bold now Horn wrote 
What can we possibly desire more than this assurance that how many or how formidable soever our enemies may be, yet there is one always ready to appear in our defense, whose power no creature is able to resist? This I know, saith David, and had we the faith of David, we should know it too. There is no enemy, no foe, no thing that could come against you that is more powerful than the God who created the universe. Period. End of sentence. Verse 10. In God will I praise his word. In the Lord will I praise his word. David knows God is for him. David will praise the Lord for his word. His word reveals his promises to us. It gives us a glimpse at the character of God. We should make it a habit to praise him for his word. Every time we read it, we should go, God, thank you for your word. Thank you for what you've put in this book to show us who you are, to show us the way, to teach us about ourselves. Thank you, God, for, for inspiring men, godly men, to write this down so people throughout generations and generations could understand who you are, could see your, your awesomeness. And this is why we have it. And then we can share it with others. Thank you, Lord, for your word, because it allows us to read. It allows us to study and to understand and be conformed more and more into the image of Christ. David says, I will praise his word. In the Lord will I praise his word. I'm praising him for his word. I'm praising him for his word to us, his message to us. So again, in verse 11, David in God have I put my trust. I will not be afraid what man can do unto me. He reiterates the fact that he knows he does, doesn't need to be afraid because he knows in the in who he knows the God in whom he trusts. Excuse me. I have put my trust in God. I'm not going to be afraid of what any man can do unto me. Now, Trapp, referring to Luther, uh, Referencing, excuse me, referencing Luther, he wrote this. When news came to Luther that both emperor and pope had threatened his ruin, he bravely answered, I care for neither of them. I know whom I have trusted. When the government comes against you, when certain cultural groups come against you, and they say, we're going to take you down, we're going to get rid of this Christianity thing that's making our lives so difficult, making our sin so hard to do in public. And we can boldly say with confidence, I care for neither of them, for I know whom I've trusted. Give it your best shot. Verse 12. Thy vows are upon me, O God. I will render praises unto thee. So David is so confident in God's deliverance that his thoughts are already preparing his sacrifice of praise. And in verse 13, For thou hast delivered my soul from death. Will not thou deliver my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of the living? Spurgeon wrote, Thus in this short psalm, we have climbed from the ravenous jaws of the enemy into the light of Jehovah's presence, a path which only faith can tread. And with that, I will thank you again for watching. Please, 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 I've asked you this several times. Let me know how I'm doing. Let me know what you like or what you don't like so I know. This is a learning process. This is, I, I said at the beginning of this long journey, I'm not a preacher, I'm not a pastor, I'm not a theologian. I'm just, I'm just a guy who desires God's word and I want to share what I learned from it. And if ever I say or, or, or share something that seems to contradict something you believe, something you, you understood about scripture, I want to know so we can dive in together because we want to be good Bereans. We want to be able to study scripture accurately and to the best of our ability so we can 
bless ourselves and as well bless others. So again, thank you for watching. Share, subscribe, go over to Twitter and you know make a comment or whatever. And we'll see you uh, on the next one. God bless.